So this talk is basically about a project that I announced a long time ago in March. And I've been working on it uh, not as full time as I would have liked, but I, I, I'm finally at a point where I feel like I can show off some of what I've been doing. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of that today. But I think more importantly, I'm going to talk about uh, the architecture, what parts of what I did were hard, and what sort of the scope of the project is. So first of all, we have a logo. It's cool. Woo. Awesome. Uh, so we have a logo now. Uh, this is cool. I'm pretty excited about it. It took us some time to get this straightened out. And talk is over now. OK, <laughs> okay so we have, we have a logo. And uh, believe it or not, ha little things like having a logo really impact uh, how much it feels like a real project. So pretty excited about this. So I want to start by talking about sort of what, how we got to here, where we are today, and uh, how that impacts what I've been working on. So first of all, in case you don't know what Tokaido is, um, I announced a project called Rails.app, which I renamed to Tokaido at some point along the lines. And the tagline of Tokaido was, let's make Rails and OS 10 easy again. And interestingly, this was very controversial. Um, and the reason why it was controversial was that a lot of people who saw my proposal did not think that what I was tackling was a real issue. Um, so this is one comment that someone said, as much as I like, as I like Yehuda, he's tackling a non-issue here. Here is a more uh, colorful, uh, so installing Rails on a Mac is largely trivial. It's five shell commands, depending on the current level of breakage of Ruby gems. That's a different story. Write a, tutori write a tutorial on your blog. Uh, and I think what was kind of interesting about this for me, this is basically how I felt. <laughs> what was kind of interesting about it for me uh, is I don't actually, my full-time job is not really building Rails apps. I write a lot of Ruby code, and I write a lot of Rails apps. But I write a lot more JavaScript code these days. And what that ends up meaning is that I end up building new Rails apps on new systems for new clients all the time. So I don't, I don't bootstrap a Rails system and then use it for two years. So all the pain is in the, is in the past, every few months I have a whole new system I need to bootstrap. And so it's very clear to me that when Homebrew is doing a weird thing or Apple shipped a new version of GCC or uh, SQLite.h is not on my system or, 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 um, this stuff happens to me as a relatively advanced user. Um, and another sort of interesting anecdote, uh, there's a guy on TC39 who is not a Ruby guy at all. TC39 is the JavaScript committee. But he's a badass JavaScript guy. Uh, he has a... Uh, I think a PhD in computer science, uh, works on, on TC39. And he was trying to use Octopress. And he offhandedly mentioned to me at one of the committee meetings, like, I can't get Octopress working. I, it used to work, and I'm trying to like, edit my blog post, and it's like, completely not working anymore. And I was like, oh, I'm sure I can get it working. Like, ping me. Like, a few weeks later, he pings me on IRC, and he's like, oh, I'm trying to get Octopress working. Here's the error. And I'm like, oh, I'll take a look at it. And, like, a, and two hours later, he was like, I just give up entirely. I cannot do this. So as much as you as a, pro as a programmer who at some point went through the pain and got everything working and now your system works so you think everything's great, as much as you feel that way, in practice, huge numbers of people, including I am guessing most people who feel like it's not a real problem, go through a fairly significant amount of pain. And to make matters worse, um, I know a lot of people like Homebrew. I use Homebrew. Homebrew is not, is not exactly a repeatable, reliable package manager. So lots of little things about how Homebrew work and change over time could impact the five quick steps that you just paste into your terminal, and, and in fact do impact that, especially when you take new operating system upgrades into consideration. So here's sort of the overview. I'm not going to talk about any of these items because I'm going to go into them in more detail. But the overview of what it ended up meaning to build something like Tokaido was basically thinking about dynamic loading versus static loading, uh, the fact that Ruby normally builds relative uh, builds binaries with hard-coded absolute load paths, um, and how to deal, how to make statically linked stuff in the first place, and then somewhat importantly, and this is something that I think people just forgot about. Uh, when, they, when they were originally thinking about the problem, is how do you set it up so that the steps that you say that work in October 2012 will probably work in October 2013, right? How do you make it so that every single time there's a new release of Ruby, you don't have to go dig up the script and figure out again how to do the entire thing from scratch? I mean, that would already be better than what people are doing today, which is that every single Ruby user has to do it. But still, it would probably mean that we wouldn't get timely updates of Tokaido as there were new patch releases because someone would have to go figure out what's going on with libyaml, what URL was at, at that again, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for me, the last bullet point turned out to be 
more of a headache and, and I think more of a triumph at the end than a lot of the other parts. So let's start with something simple. Uh, require psych. Um, in between those two lines, there's a lot of stuff going on that you don't see. Um, but something simple like this, you require psych and you get back a true and now you have a psych minor. So what exactly is going on? So uh, how many people here know what dynamic linking or dynamic loading is? And how many people know how it is different from static linking or static loading? Okay, so like half the room. So that's already a good step. Um, so OS 10, first of all, OS 10's dynamic linking and dynamic loading are not the same as the dynamic linking and dynamic loading on, on Linux. They're similar, they, are, they bear a family resemblance, but I'm gonna show there's some differences. Um, one interesting thing that OS 10 provides is there's a lot of uh, environment variables you can set that will dump out information about what's going on. So that actually turned out to be very useful for both figuring out what was going on in the first place and also figuring out whether what I had done to improve the situation was actually successful, whether it was effective. So one thing you can do is when you run a Ruby, when you run any program, you can say print out all the dynamic libraries that are being loaded. And what you can see here is that libyaml 02.dialib is being loaded dynamically. So there is a libyaml dialib that's somewhere in the system, and a dialib is basically just a bundle of executable code that instead of being hard-coded into your executable inside of Ruby, it's actually just sitting there on the side in the system somewhere, and the system will go find it. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk at all about how the system actually finds it, which again is a little bit different from how Linux works and has its own share of craziness, mainly because I just decided I'm not going to bother with this at all. I'm going to eliminate all the failure scenarios that come from the craziness around dynamically linking code. So uh, you can also, if you look and do the same thing with OpenSSL, um, you get actually a bigger list. So there's libz, libcrypto, libssl. You can see that it's actually loading a private framework called Trust Evaluation Agent. Um, it's loading libz again for reasons unknown. Um, and why, why does this happen? So the reason why it happens is that if you go and you look inside of psych parser.c, you'll see some stuff like YAML parser t, YAML parser t, YAML parser initialize, that obviously Aaron, so Aaron wrote psych, Aaron obviously did not write the write libyaml, but he wants to be able to, in his C code, call out to libyaml. So basically the way that you do this in C is you say, you tell the linker, hey, I need libyaml, please make sure that you include, that you remember to tell the program that's gonna run later, like please load in libyaml. So uh, instead of having to essentially, what you could imagine, copy and paste all the C code, instead of doing that you basically say, hey, later on, the place where you're gonna find this code is in libyaml, um, and there's usually a .h file involved that actually lets the, the compiler know what those, those declarations are doing. Um, another tool that OS 10 provides, which is pretty cool, is called OTool, and OTool lets you see, for a given executable unit, what dependencies it has. So you don't have to actually run the code and see all the, all the spewage that spits out what's going on. You can actually just say, hey, OS 10, please tell me what the dependencies of OpenSSL.bundle are. And here you can see the same list, right? LibSSL, LibCrypto, LibZ. Um, there's no crazy private framework, but um, in fact, that is a dependency. Okay. So what actually happens at runtime? So what happens at runtime is you load Ruby, and when you load Ruby, it dynamically links OpenSSL. Dynamically linking OpenSSL is, is pretty fine. It doesn't really introduce any problems because OpenSSL.bundle is just is part of Ruby. So Ruby knows where to, where to look it up, where to find it, and it doesn't really introduce any external dependencies. It's just a dependency that happens to be a separate file because you don't want to necessarily load every single uh, bundle that Ruby generates every single time you load some stuff. Um, these other things, libssl, libcrypto, and libz, are actually external dependencies. So each, each one of those three things is something that at, when you compiled Ruby in the first place, it found on the system somewhere, and now when you run it again, it wants to find it in the same place. So that's an external dependency. So based on what I just said, which is that it expects to find it in the same place, you could already start to understand why distributing a binary distribution of Ruby might be a problem, because maybe it found libz on my system in a particular location, and then it said, okay, this is where you're gonna find it later. But then, when I give the entire package to you, it happens to be in a different location. Now, if you're a Linux guy, you're probably thinking, hey, that's no problem at all. You can just, uh, the, the system will take care of it. The system will find libz. That is not how OS 10 works. OS 10 needs you to hard code exactly where the location is into the, into the uh, bundle. There's ways around it with uh, special at executable path and some RPath stuff, but 
this is a rabbit hole you don't really want to go down. OS 10 basically doesn't give you the tools that are necessary. And I think uh, even if all that worked, relying on the user to have installed and put libyaml somewhere in the load path is an external dependency that easily causes pain. So I'm sure some of you have seen at some point using something like RVM, like could not install psych, does, do not have libyaml. And that's because psych was not able to find libyaml and now there's an external dependency. You are required to install it first. And every, so I only showed a few external dependencies. Ruby has many more. Every single external dependency is an opportunity for something to fail. So um, even something that you would expect to be relatively stable, like OpenSSL, uh, Apple deprecated OpenSSL and will probably remove it at some point in the future. So you can't really rely on OpenSSL to exist. If you try to compile it, you're gonna get a bunch of deprecation warnings. Apple does all kinds of crazy shenanigans with it. So even relatively stable things, Apple does not promise will exist forever. So you might upgrade to Mountain Lion, try to run something, and now, whoops, OpenSSL does not exist anymore. Libz is no longer included in the distribution in a place the linker can find it. So that has not, neither of those have happened but OpenSSL is deprecated, so I would imagine in the next release it will probably be removed. So here is an interesting, another interesting uh, anecdote. So here's a Stack Overflow post, how to solve Ruby installation is missing psych. And someone said, hey, have you tried to install Libyaml following these instructions? So first of all, this is a fail for me already. The fact that someone tried to follow the easy five instructions and got a fail and had to go to Stack Overflow, obviously bad. So this guy provided a link and he said, yes, I have, no luck, and that's the end of the thread. Right, so, <laughs> so some guy, there's some poor soul who was trying to do something with Ruby and uh, was unable to because there was an external dependency that for some reason that it's impossible for us to divine exactly what failed, failed. So what is the solution to these problems? The solution to these problems is to not rely on com uh, a compiler to compile uh, and find the, the bundle on the, or dialib on the file system and to not rely on finding it again when you run it. So th both of those are, that's a brittle association, but even just finding them in the first place in involves things like libyaml does not exist on my file system, how do I make sure it's there in an appropriate place? And basically what that ends up looking like is that instead of Ruby opening OpenSSL, which then uh, loads a shared libSSL, you basically just essentially copy and paste libSSL, libcrypto, and libz into the OpenSSL bundle. And once upon a time when memory and file, uh, file space was limited, people really didn't like this. They wanted to be able to share uh, libSSL across as many parts of the system that use this. Um, when they tried to do that on Windows, that ended up with DLL hell. And on most systems where you distribute like an app package, either as a MSI or a .app, people tend to move away from shared libraries because there's just too much likelihood that something will have gone wrong between the time that you package up your .app and the time that the computer goes to look for it. Um, it could be something like you ran some bad homebrew on installation and it like removed user local or something, right? Like any, anything could happen. Crazy, crazy stuff happens. So um, basically the idea is that you get libSSL, you get libcrypto, you get libz, and you just put them in the OpenSSL bundle and now you don't, someone like me does it for you and now you have it in a bundle and you never have to worry about it again and your system doesn't have to go looking for it. And the way that this works in practice is libSSL, libcrypto, and libz, when you compile them, you can compile them in a special mode called static, and it will give you a, what is called an archive file, a .a. And the, uh, the goal of an archive file is to be able to take the actual binary and again, essentially copy and paste it into another binary. So that, it's not exactly a copy and paste. I would not recommend using cat or something like that. Um, but the basic idea is that it's a relocatable binary that you can just put inside of something else. Um, now, the cool thing is that once you get this working, uh, these things, you do O-Tool again, these things go away, and now you have only libsystem and libobjc, which Apple is extremely, extremely stable about, right? So if they made libsystem go away, that would be extremely bad. It has, that has not changed since OS 10.000, right? The, definitely stable. And if you go and you run uh, dialib, diald print libraries, open SSL, again, you, a bunch of stuff goes away, and you get to only bundles that actually came with Ruby, only bundles that that are part of the Ruby distribution. Now, the problem that I had here is I was like, okay, so how do I, how do I actually statically compile? And there's a lot of documentation and good tutorials for Linux, and there are fewer good tutorials for OS X, and when I went to read the linker uh, documentation, there are many, many lines of it, and it changes across different versions of OS X. So uh, I'll just save you some time, and this is the part that you care about, 
And the part that you care about is that there's a setting that is only the default since uh, Xcode 4, so you actually cannot compile Tokaido in Xcode 3. And basically, I will show you how this works, but the idea basically is here is how you tell OS X's linker to statically compile. Now, if you're, again, if you're familiar with Linux, you're probably familiar with like dash B static or something like that. No, this is not how it works in OS X. The way it works in OS X is that when, it's, when, it, when the linker is told to find libyaml, it is not told whether it wants to do it statically or dynamically. It is just told libyaml is, in, this program is interested in libyaml linking. So for every item that is in the linker path, it goes and it says, is there a libyaml.a? If the answer is yes, then it statically links. If the answer is no, it goes looking for a libyaml.dilib. If it finds a libyaml.dilib, dynamically linked. Otherwise, go to the next LD path. So what you have probably noticed that there is, is that there is no way to set up a dot slash configure to say, I would like to statically link lib libyaml. That is a thing that is determined purely dynamically when the linker happens to go looking in the file system. So when you want to build a, stat, a static distribution, you have to make sure your path is properly configured or else, right? It's easy to, this is one of these, it must be repeatable. If you don't make sure that the process that you're using to build it on an OS X system makes sure that the LD path that contains the .a files is at the front and does not have dialibs in it, you're gonna mysteriously start dynamically linking instead of statically linking. So this is not desirable, this is not what you want. Now, there's another sad story here which is that there is no standard way that you ask when you configure a Unix program to give me a .a file. There are many, many different solutions. So, so LibYaml uses disabled shared. OpenSSL is no shared without a dash dash. Uh, SQLite, you have to both say enable static and disable shared. Um, so you basically, and, and there's more. Every sing, basically every single one does a slightly different thing. And when I found this out, this also made me very sad. <laughs> that is a lion face bombing. Um, and what, what I learned is that I decided to write Tokaido at the right time um, because there's this thing called SM. And no, 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 SM is not what you're thinking. It's the system management framework, but this is the logo, so. Anyway, so th the idea behind the system management framework is to provide a standard way of talking about things like, I would like to compile a static version of libyaml. So if you go look at the libyaml configuration in, in the SM framework, there's basically a whole bunch of packages. And I would not use this as your standard package manager. It's more like a package manager for package managers. Um, what you'll find is that you, you, what, you have the current version of libyaml, where to download it from. And then if you say, please compile this statically, what is the flag? And, um, SM doesn't have this static for everything. It mostly has them for things that Tokaido needs because I went around and said, hey, can you add this static thing? Otherwise, it assumes it's dash dash static, which is basically never the case. Um, but you could, basically, this provides a way for us to talk about this. It provides a way for us to say, in OpenSSL, it's no shared, and here are some configuration flags that you're gonna need, right? It provides a way for us to talk about it. And basically, what that means is that there's an easy way to build local.a archives for packages using a static flag, a flag that's just static, and then there's gonna be a thing that actually abstracts that away. And one of the really awesome things about this whole, pro about using SM is that Tokaido's distribution itself can be compiled for Linux, for Windows, for whatever, because I'm just using, under the hood, I'm using the standard, uh, some standard tools that work in uh, environments with a C compiler. So um, I, don't, I don't actually know how well it will work on Windows, but it definitely works on Linux. We've tested it on Linux, and obviously the UI parts don't work, but the static distribution works. And um, SM also manages the LD path, so SM makes sure that if you have created an archive for something, that that is going to be at the front of the LD path when you try to compile something else. So this is, this is how we manage to do this repeatedly, repeatedly, is that I am not actually in charge of this. There's another thing that's in charge of it, and it offers me this guarantee. Um, SM is by the RVM guys, so RVM, they're building the next version of RVM on top of SM. Um, so it's pretty well maintained, it's, they're smart guys, it's based on uh, shell scripts, which uh, definitely not my cup of tea, but, <laughs> but uh, reliable. And another really cool thing about all this is that because I worked closely with the RVM guys to use SM, um, RVM eventually realized that actually reliably compiling Ruby on OS X is as hard as it looks like, uh, as, as I said it was. Now RVM always had a slight 
leg up, which is that they could just, oh, you need libyaml? We'll just go download it and put it in a directory, and then we'll link against that, and we'll hard code that path, and they could do hacks. But um, over time, what RVM realized was that some non-zero percentage of RVM users would simply fail for reasons unknown. Um, they would try to add more hacks. But eventually, uh, RVM realized, you know what? Yehuda and us are together building this thing called Tokaido. Why don't we just download the binary that we have built together and use that? So at some point in the near future, when you say RVM use 193, you're going to get a statically linked, reliable build that came out of this process, which is, uh, I think, a nice thing. There's, a there's a, another thing which I sort of hand-waved over uh, a bit, which is that um, if you actually do this O-Tool, you'll see that it is re uh, relying on I snipped this out before, but um, it's relying on a full absolute path to Ruby. Obviously, this is not going to work for me to give you a copy because you don't have a user's YCATS. And uh, absent everyone creating a user's YCATS, this seems bad. <laughs> so you can see there's a hard-coded path here, which is not great. And the cool thing is that Ruby has a feature called enable load relative, which is completely undocumented. But basically what it does is, is when you load Ruby, it, if you have compiled with the enable load relative flag, instead of it having hard-coded the exact path, it basically says, okay, where is the Ruby binary? And, ah, the Ruby binary is here, so go dot dot, go into lib, and that's where you should find the standard library. And that basically means that there's a little bit more cost to that than hard-coding the paths, but it makes the whole binary relocatable, which is really great. Um, there have been a wide variety of bugs in enable load relative, which is why it would be impossible to ship Tokaido for Ruby 187 or even 192. Um, probably the most important bug that exists with enable load relative is that OS 10 does not actually provide a mechanism for getting the location of an executable that was not dynamically loaded. So if you run Ruby, that's not dynamically loaded. That's just like the path looked it up somewhere, and OS 10 does not provide a mechanism for getting that. So it would always just look at argv and completely fail. And what Ruby 193 does, which is pretty awesome, is it basically just looks in the path for where Ruby came from, and then that's going to be where it is. So if you dynamically load Ruby, that's fine, but we're not doing that here. Um, but if you st and if you statically load Ruby, then it has a hack, basically. It looks in the path for where, from whence it came. And basically what that means is that I can't even make Tokaido for 192 because I enable load relative doesn't actually work on OS 10 on, on 192. So 193 is actually the first version of Ruby that for all these various reasons actually works reliably. And if you actually look at, uh, if you look at it, you'll see that um, the instead of, so why did Ruby want uh, the Ruby to have the dynamically loaded? It wants to not have to smash the dialog for Ruby inside of the binary. Basically the solution is if you say enable load relative, it's like, well, I guess I have no choice. I'll just smash the entire Ruby executable into the binary. So the actual Ruby binary gets bigger, but the only cost is that you, now you don't have a L Ruby dialog that you're loading, it's instead in the Ruby binary. It's, it's, uh, it's not clear to me why this is not the default. It's not clear to me why there's a Ruby dialog. Okay, and now if you uh, run OTool, we already talked about the fact that we remove libssl, libcrypto, and libz, and we also now remove libruby, which basically means, again, no external dependencies. I hand waved over the libruby one before. So another thing that is so, so sort of along these same lines, if you actually go to the Ruby bug tracker, there's like fix enable load relative on systems with lib64. I th I'm pretty sure Tokaido is the first time anybody has tried to use enable load relative for anything. So M. Pappas, who did a lot of the work on building the statically compiled Ruby using SM, has been filing a lot of tickets against enable load relative. So hopefully, hopefully enable load relative will turn out to have worked reliably on 193. Hopefully I won't have to say, use 2.0, seems great. Okay, so that's basically statically compiled Ruby. So now that I'm done with all that, now there is a way to actually build a package, which is a Ruby, that doesn't have any hard-coded paths, that doesn't have any weird external dependencies, that actually works like a regular Ruby. So how do we actually get this onto people's system? So how do we deliver it? So I'm gonna just show you a quick demo of what is already working. Um, so let me, let me do that real quick. So mirror displays. So here's Xcode. I'm gonna boot it up. And the first time it ever boots up, it asks for your password. I'll explain why in a bit. So you type in your password. And ah, it's not brought to the front. And here's Tokaido, so nothing really is going on uh, here. I'm just gonna add, a, gonna add an app, which is Ember. And then I'm going to open it in terminal. And come on. 
and now we have, we have it open in terminal. So obviously there's a little bit of unpolish in some of how this works. Um, but if you go which Ruby, you'll see that it's the Ruby that came with application support. So um, this is basically, I consider this the MVP of Tokaido of you can add things and there's a statically compiled Ruby that comes with the app package that, um, that will work. And so why did I do it like this? Why did I ship it as part of uh, an application instead of installing in the system? So the problem with installing in the system is that it will probably work immediately after you install in the system, but it's basically a fixed point in time. And if someone screws up the system after that, it's basically game over. So the cool thing about how this works is that what open a terminal does is it opens a terminal, and then once the terminal is open, it basically makes sure the path is set to the right place, makes sure the gem home is set to the right place, right? So it basically guarantees that all the environment variables are set correctly. Um, even, and, and there's no way to screw it up because we're running after your system that may be screwed up is running. So um, we'll definitely, I, I don't think I have a slide for this, but we're gonna have a way to run it as your system Ruby, um, initially through RVM and possibly through other ways. But I think for, even for me personally, I, I, like, the, I like knowing that when I open a terminal window, it's, it's definitely, it's basically guaranteed to work. It's not going to have, weird system stuff is not gonna mess it up. Um, and another thing worth pointing out here is that there's a reason it opens a terminal window. I'm not trying to write a GUI for Rails or a GUI for Ruby. I'm just trying to make uh, a much more, much less error prone way of getting Ruby to people's machines that will work reliably. Um, this is a tool that I personally would like to use. Okay, so let me unmirror. So that's the quick demo. Now if you looked closely, um, you would see that there's a thing there that says ember.js.tokaido. So what is that about? And what it's about is that as part of this process, I have also written what is essentially a pure Ruby version of Pal. I'm gonna talk next about how, how that is working. So the main difference between Pal and my pure Ruby version of Pal is that my version works with a proc file. So instead of it relying on a rack app to boot up, it basically will just run the web section of your proc file with a port and um, it will then connect to it. So you don't have to, if you wanna use like Jekyll or some other program or if you happen to use Foreman already, uh, basically it'll do, it'll do the right thing. It'll allow you to boot stuff up with a port instead of requiring configure RU. I know I personally can't always figure out how to get like a Jekyll configure RU or a static Matic configure RU. It's probably usually possible, but it's not always obvious how to achieve that versus I already know how to run this program, so please just do it. So here's what a proc file looks like. Um, I think this was invented by Heroku. And basically the idea is that you just have different sections. So here I only have a web section. Um, and dollar port is basically just the way of saying I would like to use this port. This is also what Heroku uses. So if you're already using a proc file for Heroku, um, everything, will, everything will work fine with Tokaido. So let me show a quick demo of the pure version of PAL. This is not integrated into Tokaido yet. So I will, ah, I appear to have closed Seems bad. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, so he, here I'm just gonna bootstrap. So, ah, seems very bad. Okay, mirror displays. Okay, so here's my terminal and I'm basically just bootstrapping it. You can see I'm setting some environment variables here for where some sockets should go. And I'll talk more about this architecture in a minute. So you bootstrap and it basically runs a bunch of stuff. Um, and I'm going to open IRB over here. Okay, so let's require socket, and then I'm going to get a new socket. So basically the idea behind this is that, um, that this, this socket is at a place determined by the environment variable, and this is something that the Tokaido UI will set up for you. So obviously, seems bad. Ah, I know what is going on here. Uh, so this is in code, Tokaido, bootstrap, slash temp, slash muxer. Okay, so now I have a socket, and I can write, I can write to the socket. Um, here I'm writing, please add this program that is at some location with this host and this port. So I'll do that, and you can see over here that it received the message. There's obviously more verbose logging. This is still in a uh, not fully complete state. And you can see it booted up WebRick which is basically what the proc file told it to do, which is just to run rack up. Um, and there's actually a bunch of stuff going on here. So let's just curl HTTP colon slash slash. We asked it for temp.tokaido. So now we got hello world, which is great. And if we wanna run, we can do the same thing. We can uh, run a different thing and we'll put it at a different port. And again, you can see got the message. 
and now if we curl temp2 tokaido it works. So I'll, I'll talk about the architecture in a second, but basically the idea is it's a, it's a system that works similarly to PAL except using a Brock file, and it's written in Ruby. I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to ship Node with tokaido, so. <laughs> So that's the demo. Um, so how does it work? So basically the way it works is when you say give me an app dot Tokaido, it goes into Etsy Resolver slash Tokaido. So OS 10 has this feature called Etsy Resolvers and basically you can say inside of Etsy Resolvers like, hey, for this domain, which is Tokaido, please go get the name server at this particular port. So there's a project that I created called Tokaido DNS which basically lives at that port and it will say, okay, localhost. The answer is localhost. <laughs> Um, and then you, there's a, a way to create a firewall rule um, in OS 10, which requires pseudo permissions, uh, pseudo IPFW, blah, blah, blah. And that will basically say, okay, don't go to port 80, go to port 23456. And that will go to a, a, another project that I created called Muxer, which is basically doing the proxying, which will then call, say, go to localhost the whatever port that you told it, and then that will go to your app. So that's basically the architecture. It's a little bit crazy, but it's actually almost identical to PAL's architecture. It's just, if you want temp.tokaido, you have to actually do all these steps, um, unfortunately. So what is, how does this actually get delivered? So obviously, um, people are not going to be opening IRB and typing stuff in. So basically, the way it works is that the first time you load Tokaido, it's going to uh, install a firewall, firewall rules launch daemon. And basically this launch daemon, the reason you need a launch daemon is that IPFW requires sudo and you don't want to have to be typing in your password every single time you open Tokaido. So we create a launch daemon that has sudo permissions that we can talk to. Um, and the way this works is that there's a socket that it listens on and you can, uh, I'll show you in a second how that works. Uh, and then another thing that, that Tokaido does when it boots up is it boots up Tokaido Bootstrap and creates a manager and listens on the Tokaido socket. So basically it runs on the, only the first boot, it launches the launch daemon, otherwise it launches the manager, and the manager loads Tokaido DNS and Muxer, which are the two programs I talked about, and manager is basically in the same memory space as Muxer. So the first thing, now when you boot the application, it just sends a message called enable firewall rules slash n to the launch daemon, which will actually go, and now that it has pseudo control, it could do enable, it can do the IPFW command, so the idea here is that, unlike PAL, I don't want this running all the time. I only want everything running when you actually have the app open. Um, so that way, when you close the app, everything continues to work as expected. So that's just a philosophical, uh, Tokaido is supposed to be self-contained. It's not supposed to take over your system. So the next thing, so now after it does that, now it just goes off, it stays off in the side and listens for things at localhost 80, calls it a day. And uh, now, the, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to go and it's going to send all the, it's going to send a bunch of commands to the manager which are basically add these, add these applications at these ports, so it's like a little line protocol, and the manager is going to go and add the application, which is in Ruby, and then eventually, immediately, assuming that there were no errors, like you didn't try to bind to the same port multiple times or use the same host, otherwise you get an error response, you're going to get a thing that says added, and the idea here is that Tokaido can use this information to like show that it's loading, right? And then at some later point, you'll get a ready message which allows you to show like a green, a a green button. Um, yeah, that happens because that happens. It's backwards. Um, and you can also go if the user says, I actually don't want this app anymore to be on, disable it. You, you can call remove and that's gonna call remove app. And then at some later point, it's gonna say, okay, I removed the app and that's gonna send removed and that's how uh, the application is aware. So one really cool thing about this project is that because the point of the project is to have a reliable version of Ruby, I can actually write a lot of Ruby code with, a lot, with not a lot of stress because I know that I can test on the exact Ruby that I'm shipping and if it works, I don't have to worry that the user has some crazy Ruby. So I, I'm writing a lot of sort of network code that would normally give me heartburn, like who knows what kind of crazy stuff is going on, but I know exactly what kind of crazy stuff is going on because I already shipped it, so it's cool. So that's, that's sort of the architecture of the PAL stuff. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I think it will, I think bec people like PAL and I think they will like uh, a more scoped version of it. I think this, this is cool. Um, and finally, I want to show some mockups of what the full UI is going to look like. So this is what we showed already. This was the original mockup. It was replaced with a Ruby icon, which you saw in the quick demo before. And you can see the little green icon there and there's like a drop down, stuff like that. So this is like the new app screen. This is a logger, so basically specifically for Rails apps, 
there will be a visual logger that you can use for, to see what's going on. And the idea basically is, now that you're using Tokaido, like you would be using PAL, you don't really have a terminal tab open with your logs. So you would like to see some logs somewhere. And I guess we could just dump your logs, or we could spend some time to make something that actually adds some value. Um, and I, and a lot, I did a lot of thinking about what makes sense to be in a UI, and I think I came to the conclusion that people are not particularly attached to their like tailing log workflow. So if I provide something that's better than the tailing log workflow, I don't think I'm gonna get a lot of pain. Like for example, if I added a run this rake task, I think people would be very emo about that because I would be taking over something that really belongs in the command line. I don't think tailing the logs is, is a, a thing people are particularly attached to. So you can see here there's some stuff, there's some cool stuff. Um, I think the top thing is gonna change because the exact response time in development mode doesn't really matter. Um, but you can see, like, you can see which, res which requests came from the parent. So if you hit a page and that asks for a bunch of assets, you can see that they're nested together. Um, you can see whether things were errors, uh, how long things took, what the, uh, whether something was a 500 or 200 or whatever. And additionally, there will be a bunch of notifications. So obviously, like your page had an error as a notification, but also um, we'll periodically run stuff like bundle outdated for you and give you a yellow notification that says like, hey, this is outdated, maybe you care about it. And the X will basically be like, I actually don't care about this particular bundle outdated. And then if it changes, you'll get the message again. Um, things like deprecation warnings, um, things like maybe even like code climate, right? So things like r running uh, code, code uh, cleanliness against your app and then telling you like, hey, you should maybe look at this, here's some code to look at. Basically just having a, a place to put notifications that are either urgent, the red, or more just like, this might be something you're interested in. And I think we won't initially, but we'll eventually have a, a plugin architecture so people can add their own notifications, like the compass deprecation warning we probably won't ship with, but it should be easy to add. Um, also this screen, um, is, it's the only part of the OS X app that will be written as a UI web view. And again, the idea is that if you're SaaS and you want to provide your own logging view that's not going to be the exact same thing as a Rails view, you should be able to drop that in. There'll be some kind of JavaScript to OS X protocol for, like you'll get notified when there's a request that came in, et cetera. And then finally, this is just the, uh, creating, uh, the application editing screen, and the idea here is you can do stuff like choose an icon or we'll find one for you or whatever, that's great. Um, change the host name, uh, you can see it tells you what, if you wanna share. So one cool thing here is that because every single app has their own port, it's easy to share over a local network, like hey, check this out, and it tells you like austin.local colon blah. Um, you can choose to auto assign a public port or not. Um, we also wanna support people who don't wanna use Tokaido Ruby sandbox, so like if you wanna say, I'll just use RVM, that's great. We want the UI to work for you. Um, and then we also wanna have these settings should be, should be configurable via a YAML file so that people can say like, I always want this icon, I always want uh, auto assign public port, I, I want this to be my application name, and have that checked into uh, source control so everybody is basically in the same, on the same page. So that's basically, that's basically where we're heading. I think we'll probably have something in between what we have now and this in, within a month or so. So I don't want to announce any specific dates, but we're making good progress. Um, I want to say thank you to some awesome people. So, M. Pappas was the one who helped me initially with all the SM stuff, getting it to a reliable place. So um, really big thanks. Wayne helped me with uh, some SM stuff that M. Pappas was not sure about. So SM is definitely not a, uh, a thing that regular mere mortals want to be using, but I think, I think it, it provides a lot of value for our use case. Um, Austin Bales did all the mockups that you saw, and um, it's driving basically the, the implementation. Patrick, who works with me at Tilda, um, is working on the, the Cocoa app. Um, and Terrence, front, front row, uh, he, he's been doing a lot of testing. So something I didn't talk about is Terrence has actually been taking the static build, bringing it to Rails Girls, not without the UI, and just seeing if the static build actually holds up to a tutorial. And uh, we got really, really good feedback. Um, I think there were a couple of issues that we hit early on with ZSH or something. But by and large, it was a massively improved experience versus the just follow these five steps for people who are just starting. Um, so I, uh, that's really great, and um, Terrence, thank you for that. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I, I actually wanna close by saying one thing, which is when I started, I think it's, there's a tendency to look at this tool and say, this is mostly a tool for noobs. It mostly solves a pain point that I don't have. Um, and it is a, a very important goal for me, for at least me to use it, I want to use it, so I'm, I, we're not really making trade-offs where if you're a noob, it's gonna be great, but then, oh, I wanna build real stuff with this, this is impossible. Like, um, and I think DHH says this right, which is, 
Um, everybody has to cross a barrier between being a noob and being an advanced user, and if suddenly they fall off a cliff because the tool stops working, that's terrible. So you should build tools that are good for real developers, and, they sh and if you do a good job, they'll happen to work well for noobs. Um, so that, that's my philosophy on the project. Thank you very much. Thank you.